Hello and welcome to this virtual tour of Kingsland Minster. The church was built in 1101 by Herbert de Lozinga, the first Bishop of Norwich. It was dedicated to St Margaret of Antioch, St Mary Magdalene and all Virgin Saints, and has been known as St Margaret's Church for centuries. According to legend, St Margaret was swallowed whole by the devil, disguised as a dragon. The crucifix she always wore irritated the dragons in it so much that it released her unharmed. Three dragons with crosses coming out of their mouths are included in the coat of arms of King's Lynn. St Margaret was martyred in the year 304. The church dedicated to St Margaret was shared between the parish and the priory of Benedictine monks adjacent to the church. They looked after the interest of Norwich Cathedral Priory in the West Norfolk. In 2011, the Bishop of Norwich named the church the King's Lynn Minster in recognition of its service to the local community. The west side of the church faces the River Great Ouse, and you can see examples of many types of architecture on this stone wall and its two towers. The towers were built in 1150, and the Norman architecture of the time is still visible on the base of the southwest tower. You can see the intersecting arcading and weed moulding, which are characteristic of the Norman style. Nothing above ground remains of the 1101 building, but this is the earliest of the church fabric. Further up the tower is the 13th century early English architecture, while the top layer is 14th century decorated Gothic. On top of this tower was a tall spire, similar to the one on St Nicholas's Chapel. It collapsed during a violent storm in September of 1741. Falling onto the nave of the church, it prompted a large-scale restoration of the church in the Georgian style. Above the crossing was an impressive lantern tower which measured 143 feet tall. It was dismantled following the collapse of the spire and never rebuilt. There are other features of the church that no longer exist. On the Saturday marketplace is an outline of a charnel chapel. It was built in 1325 and was used to house remains disturbed by digging new graves on the churchyard. It was demolished in 1779 and later a butcher's shambles with the grammar school rooms above stood on its spot. The shambles were later demolished in 1914. The foundations of the original charnel chapel were uncovered during maintenance works on the marketplace. The main entry into the church is through the west door. From here you have a great view of the church through the nave all the way to the chancel. The church follows an established plan of a church building with a spacious nave, aisles on either side housing chapels and the chancel of the main sanctuary. In the 16th century the church is thought to have been at its largest and most decorated. It included wider aisles and many chapels for private prayer. Just like the outside, there are many architectural styles and furnishings to be found inside the church. Above the main door is the Great West Window, filled with stained glass panels. The stained glass window was erected in 1927, but was commissioned earlier by Thomas Johnson Sappings and his cousins, who were members of a local brewing family. The glass was designed by Donald Torton, but the stonework of the window dates from the 15th century and was restored in 1998. During the Civil War, Kings Lynn was known as a town with royalist sympathies. It was besieged by Cromwell's troops in 1643, and a cannon was set up across the river at the churchyard in West Lynn. A cannonball shot from there pierced through the west window, falling into the church nave. The stained glass combines religious images associated with the Church of St Margaret's, as well as scenes inspired by the history of King's Lynn. The first two rows present the emblems of the Passion of Christ. The two rows below contain coats of arms relating to the church and the town, and they include the Guild of Corpus Christi, the Trinity Guild, King's own Yorkshire Light Infantry, the three dragons' heads for St Margaret, the three lions of England for King John, the royal arms of Henry VIII, and crests of the Benedictine and Franciscan orders. The central row shows Christ surrounded by saints relating to the churches of King's Lynn. There is St Edmund, who was the king of East Anglia. A church dedicated to him once stood in North Lynn. St Nicholas, who was the patron saint of sailors and to whom the Chapel of Ease connected with St Margaret's Church was dedicated. St John the Evangelist, whose church was built in 1846. The Virgin Mary, to whom a Catholic church in town is dedicated, as well as the Red Mount Chapel, which was popular among pilgrims travelling to her shrine in Walsingham. St George was a patron of a local merchant's guild, and he shares a dragon with St Margaret of Antioch, who was shown holding a model of the church. The bottom row contains four scenes from the town's history. There is the granting of the town charter by King John in 1204, 
as well as King John presenting his sword to the mayor. A meeting between Cardinal Wolsey and the mayor in cooperation of Lynn in 1520, and finally the signing of the new town charter by Henry VIII in 1524, which granted the town a greater independence and the new name of King's Lynn. From this spot you will also be able to see the original Norman arches of the towers. The arch of the northwest tower shows a dramatic tilt to one side. This lien was reported in 1419 and the tower threatened collapse. The land it was built on was unstable, with the riverbank originally stretching roughly to where the church gates now stand. An appeal for funds was made and the tower was finally rebuilt in 1453. In the base of the southwest tower is St Edmund's Chapel. It's a quiet and beloved chapel used for private prayer and reflection. At its centre is the Peace Globe, made by William Corduroy of East Ruston. Candles can be lit and placed inside the globe to remember loved ones. Looking around the chapel you can spot the impressive and decorated arches, and just below the windows of the tower there is a passage, from which Norman-inspired arcading can be admired. This walkway gave the Priory monks access to the upper levels of the church. The clear story walkways continue through the nave and the chancel, but they are no longer there. The windows provide plenty of light and old doors lead to the roof of this tower. Built as the priory and parish church, the building was divided into two separate worship spaces in the Middle Ages. The nave served the parishioners, where they celebrated mass and sacraments and prayed in the aisle chapels. The chancel was reserved for the monks, and they celebrated mass and prayed at certain times during the day there. The nave begins with the Victorian stone font. It's carved with figures of the four evangelists, the dove which symbolises the Holy Spirit, and a scene from the baptism of Christ. Its carved wooden top is stored separately, and the font itself is surrounded by colourful tiles, which are also Victorian in origin and present many different designs and patterns. Matthew Brettingham was the architect responsible for the rebuilding of the nave after the collapse of the spire in 1741. He favoured the classical style, and his Georgian version of the nave is still present in elements of the roof, walls and columns. Another feature of the Georgian restoration is the richly carved wooden pulpit, decorated with floral designs and angels. The sounding board above the pulpit contains Hebrew letters, which spell out the name of God. Behind the pulpit, and attached to the column, is a crucifix commemorating all prisoners of war who were in captivity in the Far East between 1941 to 1945. The nave altar under the crossing is a modern addition and a memorial to members of the Royal Air Force who died in the Second World War. The altar was installed in the 1960s. Near here, on another column, next to the mayor's pew is an 18th century rack for the King John sword, as the town sword is known. It forms part of the town's regalia and is carried before the mayor during processions. It rests on the rack during civic services. The most remarkable treasures in the South Isle are the two largest monumental brasses in England, commemorating two medieval merchant families of Lynn. The brasses were made at a workshop in Flanders from a copper and zinc alloy known as Latin. The brasses commemorate Adam de Walsoken and Robert Bronch, as well as their wives. The two men were mayors of Bishop's Lynn. Their wealth is demonstrated by the lavish clothing they are depicted as wearing, as well as the size and craftsmanship of the brasses. Bronch's brass shows a scene of the peacock feast he gave for King Edward III and Queen Philippa when they visited the town in 1349. The rubbings mounted on the walls show the fine detail of the brasses more clearly.
Separating the southern aisle from the chancel is a 14th century wooden screen. Looking closely, small carvings of tumblers and grotesque poses can be seen. The easternmost part of the South Isle houses the Benedict Chapel, dedicated in 1991 to mark the Benedictine Priory once connected to the church. Wooden boards high up on the walls of the chapel record benefactors and charitable donations to the church, dating back to the 1700s. The community of Benedictine monks in King's Lynn was always small. It usually included the prior in charge of the church and priory, as well as four other monks. The priory set up in Lynn was a cell of the Norwich Cathedral Priory. Monks living here celebrated Mass eight times a day through communal prayer in Latin, first at 2am in the morning and at regular intervals until 6pm, when their day ended. They prayed and chanted songs in the chancel of St Margaret's Church. The monks believed in combining prayer and hard work, and they feel, filled their time with manual work such as gardening, cleaning and copying of manuscripts and writing. They would also have offered shelter and aid to any pilgrims and other travellers making their way through Lynn. The only remains of the Priory today are elements of the cottages on Priory Lane, where the remains of Priory rooms are still evident. The Priory was dissolved during the Reformation. The chancel, originally for the sole use of the monks, retained many of its riches and an elevated atmosphere. It remained unharmed after the collapse of the spire in the 18th century. Its arches date back to the 13th century and are carved with foliage patterns. There are faces carved in the stone above the arches, one of which is a depiction of a green man. The clear story windows were erected to provide more light for the large church and were rebuilt in 1497. The narrow clear story passage still stands and there is a narrow and dark staircase leading up to the upper level. The decorated reredos commands much of the attention of the chancel. It's a Victorian edition designed by G.F. Bodley. It was installed in 1899 thanks to a generous donation of £1,000 by Miss Margaret Blenko. On the central panels of the Reredos, Christ can be seen lifting his hand in the gesture of a blessing. Below him is the scene of the Annunciation and right above the altar is the scene of the Crucifixion. Other figures included on the Reredos are early church fathers, Jerome, Gregory, Augustine and Ambrose, as well as Hugh of Lincoln and St Felix, East Anglia's apostle. Above the Reredos is an east window, also known as a rose window because of its circular shape. Although it looks like stained glass, the figures are actually painted onto the glass. At the centre is a depiction of Christ, with Mary Magdalene and St Margaret of Antioch on his sides. The rest of the figures are angels, dressed in colourful fabrics. This impressive window can be seen from all the way to the west door, The chancel also houses 14th century stalls with misericords. When the monks worshipped in the chancel, they would stand while singing and praying, often for long periods of time. Misericords were also known as mercy seats, because they were folded when the monks were standing, but they could still perch on the wider edge and rest, while appearing to be standing. The misericords were carved with faces, some of them royals. It is possible that the stalls were commissioned in memory of Edward the Black Prince, son of Edward III, who died in 1376. Priory accounts revealed that the stall was still unfinished in 1380. The faces on some of the misericords have been identified as the Black Prince with his coat of arms, Henry Dispenser, the Bishop of Norwich, as well as members of the Black Prince's family. An earlier misericord of a slightly different and possibly earlier style is thought to present Edward III. Four shields carved into the stalls were suggested to represent the sponsors of the stalls. Roger the fourth Baron of Scales, William Ufford the second Earl of Suffolk, William Lord Bardolph, and Sir John Howard the second. 
Interestingly, the carved faces and shields are not the only historical feature in the chancel stalls. In later centuries, names and dates have been carved into the wood. This early graffiti provides a record of parishioners and those participating in worship in the chancel. The dates carved here go as far back as 1620, and many of them are from the 1700s. The Trinity Chapel is situated close to the chancel and separated from it by a medieval screen. Today it's close to visitors and serves as a vestry, but in the medieval times it would have been frequented by members of the Holy Trinity Guild. The Guild of the Holy Trinity was a religious community of local merchants that gave generously to the fabric of the church, supporting its repairs and maintenance. The chapel was used by them for private prayer and to commemorate deceased members. Marjorie Kemp, a medieval mystic and pilgrim from Lynn, was a member of the guild. The guild hall was across the Saturday marketplace from the church. It still stands and houses the stone hall of the town hall today. Trinity Chapel was first consecrated in 1472, when it would have been much wider. It was narrowed to accommodate increasing traffic and expansion of the Saturday marketplace. The dark wood reredos in this chapel is in the style of a Bavarian village famous for its skillful wood carving and passion plays. The entire chapel was restored by William Burkitt, who was a mayor of Lynn in 1856 and 1887, and is dedicated to the memory of his wife, Emma Burkitt. On the floor of the chapel are memorial brasses commemorating prominent merchant families of Lynn, complete with short histories and examples of heraldry. A brass rubbing commemorates Sir Walter Coney, a prominent merchant and mayor of Lynn in the 15th century. Interestingly, on the memorial, Coney's merchant mark is shown on a shield, as a substitute for a heraldic shield. The most prominent feature of the North Isle is the organ. It serves the church during services, choir practices and recitals. Charles Burney was a musician and a composer living in London until he was recommended a change of scenery for his ill health. He came to Kings Lynn in 1751 at the age of 25. Here he was appointed as the organist at St Margaret's Church, with an annual salary of £100. The church organ at the time was in poor state, and Bernie recommended that a new organ should be made. John Snetzler was an organ builder of Swiss birth, working in England, and he was commissioned to produce an organ for the church. It was finished in 1754 at a cost of £700, and installed on a gallery in front of the west window. The ornamental wooden case was made by Snetzler's younger brother, Leonard. The organ was acclaimed as the finest in the country and boosted Snetzler's career until he became an organ builder for the king. Burney stayed in Kings Lynn until 1760. One of his children was Fanny Burney, born in Kings Lynn and later became a novelist. Later in life, Charles Burney married Elizabeth Allen, who came from a prominent local merchant family. The organ in its current state dates back from 1895 and is the work of Wordsworth and Co. of Leeds. Wordsworth carefully preserved 13 stops of Snetzler's parts. A restoration in 2001 completed the grand designs for the organ by Wordsworth, which he was unable to complete due to a lack of funds, as well as reinstating the characteristic Snetzler sounds that have been lost over time. The organ now boasts 59 stops and 3,459 pipes. In front of the organ is a Jacobean screen from 1584, later restored in 1621. A matching screen for the opposite side of the crossing was made in 1913. Back at the west end of the church, we come to the North Tower. In 2019, after securing a National Lottery Heritage Grant and gathering the remaining funds needed, a purpose-built space was created for the parish offices. This added to the history of architecture and building changes inside the church. On the north porch is a slate column engraved with the names of the priors and vicars of the church since the Reformation. It turns on a bearing made by Cooper Roller Bearings of Kings Lynn. This tower is also where much of the modern stained glass is housed. Inside of the parish's offices, we can get up close to the stained glass windows. A small stained glass installation with a flame of the Holy Spirit 
commemorates Reverend Justin Bambury. The tower is also dominated by a large stained glass designed by Michael Clark, an East Anglian artist, which was installed in 1967. A smaller stained glass window commemorates Stephen Arthur Thomas Coxon, who was mayor of Lynn in 1923. His wife was Florence Ada Coxon, who was remembered on a stone plaque nearby. She became the first female mayor of Lynn in 1925. The North West Tower is also the bell tower of the church. The bells are housed in the highest floor, with the silence chamber below it and a ringing chamber below still. The ringers sound the bells for services, including weddings, as well as special times during the year to mark anniversaries, civic occasions and royal birthdays. On the wall in the ringing chamber is a telegram from Winston Churchill thanking for the appeal rung to celebrate the end of the Second World War. The bells were cleaned, restored and improved during a restoration project in 2005. Examples of some more graffiti can be found in the bell ringing chamber, alongside carvings in the walls of names, dates and stonemasons' marks. A walkway from the ringing chamber leads in front of the Great West Window and to the South West Tower. Although this tour of Kings and Minster may seem quite comprehensive, this historic church has many more treasures to discover. For over 900 years, the church has stood at the centre of Kings Lynn, witnessing and recording its history within its walls. We hope to welcome you to our church in the future. <laughs>